Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, it's a new week, and uh, we have lots of things that we need to do. Um, I have maybe preemptively, uh, uh, you know, decided that we uh, are going to draw some of these things on a line, and we'll see how we do. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for all that you have done in our lives. And we just ask for your presence here as we open your word together. We ask for light and understanding and forgiveness for our sins. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose for us. And we ask that we can submit to your will and that we can fulfill uh, your desire for us. We ask for understanding in Daniel chapter 11 and how it relates to the present time. We also pray for one another and for those with illnesses, health problems that uh, uh, they may have to face. And we ask, Lord, for good health for each person. Help us to follow and serve you today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Okay, so <clears throat> we had started looking at um, some of these verses and and I, I don't think that we can really move much further ahead until we uh, go back and start drawing some of these lines. And, um, you know, last week we looked at, you know, changing the USA and the papacy. That was from being uh, the Republicans and Egypt being the Democrats. There's all kinds of things that we are considering. And, and I always hate making apologies about this. But this is a very... Uh, detailed and uh, slow study. It's meticulous. It doesn't mean that we're always right. Um, and anybody watching these videos can definitely uh, have suggestions to try to correct us uh, when we're going astray. But, um, you know, this is the method that we've chose to do, uh, to compare scriptures with scriptures, to put line upon line, uh, of, of these histories and to measure the time, uh, to look at the times periods in the past in these histories in Daniel chapter 11 and, um, and also compare them with the present. So we have a present truth application and it's not the only present truth application that's possible it is these lines, uh, can be applied in different ways at different times. So we're trying to understand them in the context of the movement at the present time. Now, as far as the lines that we have drawn, um, you know, if we go back uh, with Daniel chapter 11, I think we, we got this line dealing with um, uh, the four winds um, being this period of time. We just took the Hebrew uh, words, four winds of heaven. And we added them up and they were 16,073 days. And that's the number of days from uh, the start of that. Uh, I believe it's from the start of the war in uh, on December 24th, um, 1979. I don't think it's the end of the war in February 15th. Um, I should have put how many years it was. That would make it easier. Um, but, you know, we drew some lines. We drew a line also dealing with, uh, the kings of Persia. And, um, and, and we had studied so many different things dealing with, um, the line of Greece and, and so forth. Now, the line that we want to draw, uh, like we haven't really drawn out the line of Greece in detail. And I don't know if we should start there or if we should start uh, with this uh, other line, the line dealing with Rome. And this is the Rome uh, starting with uh, Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision, exalt themselves to establish the vision. And um so I don't know. I don't know where the best place to start is. I, I, I do kind of think I want to start with Rome um, 
1989. Uh, but this, this requires us to go over some of the things that we had studied previously. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Should we, should we go back all the way to Greece and start drawing that line? Or should we just leave Greece for now and start with Rome? Any suggestions? I mean, we've been dealing with Rome for quite a while and we want to get Rome finished and, and drawing the line would help us. I mean, we do need to draw a line for Greece as well at, at some point because I want to have these lines drawn out. We, we sort of have an idea about Greece. Um, I, think, we're sure. I, I think we're going to need to start with this with Greece in order to more clearly understand the situation with Rome. Okay. And, and that makes sense because maybe there's things about the line of Greece um, that will help us connect further in the line of, of Rome. Okay, so that's where we're going to start. So going back to the line of Greece, I mean, that's going to start with Alexander, right? So in verse uh, three. So so we're just going to do a quick review here. Um, and while we do this review, we'll see what we can do about drawing out this line. Um, now, we all, we all with, with Greece, of course, we did have, you know, as I... As I mentioned, we did have a partial line, right? So when we get to Greece, it's this line here. So this line um, has all those characteristics we have on the line. It has uh, a period of darkness. It has um, the, the way marks, the first angel arriving. So that's the time at the end. It's formalization, empowerment, the second angel arriving, uh, and so forth. And we put this in a present truth application what we what we haven't done um, you know is clearly marked out uh, the line of Greece in its sort of actual way right so so we just drew out the present truth line uh, but it might be helpful to sort of put some of these other things in a line as well so does that make sense to start with uh, the actual dates of this line of Greece this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. I think because, it would. Okay. So, um, so we're going to start with Alexander. So we're, we're, we're going to be ignoring the stuff in the red right now. And we're just going to be looking at Alexander the Great. So to do this, I need to set up a, a line to draw. So anybody have the dates that we would have for Alexander? Do we have any definite dates or are we just. Are we going to be looking at dates of major battles? Are we going to be looking at dates of. Well, the dates of the things that are in the scriptures. Okay. Right. So we have these particular dates. So. And we have to decide, you know, the time of the end, the period of darkness, all, all those types of things. But with Alexander the Great, it says he shall stand up, shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So where would we place that time wise? You know, or, you know how are we going to deal with is Alexander going to be uh, the time of the end? Is he going to be a period of darkness? Now, we can see in the line that we have here in the present truth application that we're going to start it with the Soviet-Afghan War on December 24th, 1979. Right. So remember when we took that um, number of days, whatever it was, 16,079, or I can't remember the number, um, that went from December 25th, 1979 to December uh December 24th, 1979 to December 25th. Um, that, that was kind of very remarkable that you can take the four winds of heaven and it's going to give you that number. So, so, so anyway, what dates do we have for Alexander? If somebody can bring that up. Well, he assumes overall command of the armies following his father's assassination in 336 BC. Okay, so 
So 336 BC, do we have a date for that or just, just the general year? I'm, look, I'm looking right now. We have a general year and that's it. Okay. Now, so if we're going to have this um, parallel the USSR, so we're looking at the present truth application, uh, this would have to be uh, something preliminary to the time of the end. Now, I would think the time of the end would be the death of Alexander, right? Because this is going to be about the division of Alex Alexander's kingdom. So well, if we're going to have this period of darkness, um, this is going to be, you're saying from 336? Right. And it's 330, right, that he dies? Or 332? When does, when does he die? Just a minute. 323. He dies 13, in 1323, uh, uh, 13th day of the sixth month of 323 BC. Okay, so on the chart we had 332. What was that? 332 BC. I'm looking. Uh, uh, that would be when he defeats Medo Persia. Oh, okay. So he defeats Medo Persia. So, so we would need to put that as a battle. So, do you know the battle? Um, Guacamole. Something okay. like that. Hence. Some okay. online sources will get 331. Okay. Okay. So we're going to have, uh, Alexander, Alexander the Great. And, um, so this is a period from 336 BC to 323. So I wasn't really planning to do this. So I, I mean, right now we're just going to try to, um, you know, we're, we're, we'll look at a lot of the different details as we go through this. Yeah, so he dies uh, in 323. He's born the 20th or the 21st of July in 356. And he dies the 10th or 11th of June in 323. So he succeeded his father, Philip, to the throne in 336 at the age of 20. He spent most of his ruling years conducting a lengthy military campaign from Western Asia, Central Asia, parts of South Asia, and Egypt. So in 334, he invaded the Archimedes. Persian Empire and began a series of campaigns that lasted for 10 years. So, so they're going to have here, we're going to obviously, so there was the battles of, uh, on November 5th, 333, that's the Battle of Issus, and Gogamala is in 331, they say. Now, we have it on our chart as 332. I think we talked, talked about this. Uh, before, um, I mean, I know we did. I just don't remember the details. So on the chart, does it say the Battle of? It just says he defeats the Persians. What does it say on the chart? I'm not going to go there. Uh, it just says he overcame the Persians. Okay. So we don't know which specific battle they're referring to. So we have the three, Siege of Tyre in three. 32, which lasted from January to July, and the victory resulted in the control of the Levant. Alexander then again fought at the siege of Gaza. Persian troops count, Persian troop counts in Egypt were diminished due to many soldiers being removed so, to support the Battle of Issus and dying there. As a result, the Persian satrap of Egypt, Mazakis, peacefully surrendered to Alexander upon his arrival. <coughs> and then you're going to have, uh, so they're going to have this battle. I'm just reading through it quickly here. So they're saying late in, in the late spring or early summer of 331, Alexander headed from Egypt northwest through Syria toward the Tigris River. In July or August, Alexander reached the Cassus on the Euphrates River. And so he crossed the Euphrates in the summer of 331. From there, Alexander followed a northern route instead of a direct southeastern route to Babylon. While doing so, he had the Euphrates and the mountains of Armenia on his left. So, 
Um, so after the Macedonian army had crossed the Tigris, a near total lunar eclipse occurred on the 20, on the 21st of September, 331 BC. Four days later, Alexander's army spotted members of Masius's cavalry and captured one or two who gave information about the location of Darius' army at Gagamela, some eight miles away. So they do some calculations to figure out, following the calculations, the date of the Battle of Gagamela must have been the 1st of October in 331. Okay, so so this is a, a battle with the Archimedes Empire that goes on beginning back all the way in, so we're going to say, so, so 334. I don't know what the series of campaigns were. Um, it says 336 to, th um, let me see here. Okay, so the Wars of Alexander. So this is going to, the Battle of Granicus River on May in 334 BC. So this is a lot of stuff to s sort out. Okay, so we might add some of these details later. But but now, anyway, what we have is we're going to say that, that this this is the period of darkness. So it's it obviously has some details that we can look at later. Um, but it's going to be Alexander the Great as the period of darkness. Now, why would we say that? What What is it that Alexander the Great, if we have a line, Alexander the Great is the period of darkness. What is this line about? Would the darkness of this with Alexander be because of his willingness to fight versus his father's use of diplomacy? Well, I don't know. The, the period of darkness needs to relate to the line that we're going to draw. And this line is going to be about the division of Alexander's kingdom. So we don't know exactly what happens. But it's going to be battles... Uh, first, the dividing of the kingdom into four, and then obviously uh, into two, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic empires, the north and the south. And um, now it's symbolizing something. So I, I don't know how Alexander's, uh, you know, idea of using war instead of diplomacy would relate to what happens to the division of his kingdom as far as a line. Because you're going to have a message that is in response to that. But maybe, maybe there's something there that I, you know, just my mind's not connecting it yet. Um, because we have to think about what this the division of, of the Greek kingdom is, because it is a civil war. And, um, it, it's parallel to a civil war in our history, in our lives. Right. So, you know, we first get uh, the history and then we see the present truth application. And, and what we have with Alexander the Great that parallels our history is the Soviet Union. So he's going to parallel the Soviet Union. Um, right. So uh, is that making sense? What, what we're talking about here, how we're trying to approach this? I think that that's logical. Okay, so now we don't have all these way marks drawn out yet, but um, we would have to have a first message and the second message. So in, in our lines itself and, and how we have looked at this history, uh, we're going to see all of this, these events that occur prior to the time of the end. And then, of course, uh, the time of the end is going to be um, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. That's November 9th, 1989. So that's going to be our way mark in our line, right? Um, and then his kingdom is going to be broken, right? And, and, and he's going to die in 323. So, so we mark that period from November 9th to December 25th, 1991. It's at that point that it's divided towards the four winds of heaven, right? So in our history, it's December 25th, 1991, the end of the 777 inclusive days. Um, and 
and and then we know that these four Hellenistic empires represent globalism, right? So Greece is a globalist power. And what ends up happening is you're going to see the transition of this atheistic, um, uh, you know, hedonistic power, right? This is the the king of the south in this in in our lines, right? Here it's just Greece, okay? Um, but it's going to it's going to move that that characteristic that first France had and then the Soviet Union had is now going to move to the UN, right? So you now have the United Nations. And um, and that's all going to be under the first message. So we would probably have in our line, you know, the arrival of the first message is going to be November 9th, 1989. It's formalization, maybe, on December 25th, 2021. And then there would be its empowerment, right? So, so we talked about that before. We didn't draw it on a line. We'd have to decide what the empowerment is in that line. Now, uh, in the line that we had drawn before, which had to do specifically with this period of time of the four winds of heaven. Um, so this was 16,073 days. And that went to December 25th, 2023 not December 25th, 2021. So that's a period of 44 years. And it's an inclusive count if we go from um, December 24th, 1979 to December 25th, 2023 of 16,073 days. And we have this December uh, 25th, 2023 date here. I should show you the chart again so you can look at what I'm looking at. Right. So so this was the third angel arriving in our history. And um, um, and this had come from the years that were for years 8141 from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, 2023. And then we had the second wit witness, the four winds of heaven going from the start of this Soviet Afghan war. So. If we're trying to parallel the Soviet Afghan war with um, the Medo Persian war, um, you know, how, how do we parallel that? So the Soviet Afghan war, I mean, that's the Soviets against Afghan, right? Afghanistan. But it, it is also a proxy war, right? Yes, it was. Correct. Yeah. So how do we parallel that with this war between uh, Alexander and the Medo-Persian Empire? I mean, well, we know Medo-Persia, we have Medo-Persia represent uh, the United States, right? At least we have done that. And, um, and this, and, and Greece represents the globalists. Now, in this case, in the story of Alexander, he's going to defeat Media Persia. Right? In our history, uh, we don't have that happening. We have uh, the king of the north defeating the king of the south. Here, the king of the south is defeating the king of the north, so to speak. Right? In, in those symbols. How do we account for that? Is this some kind of mirror? Is it... Uh, similar to where we have 1798, you have the king of the south defeating the king of the north, and then the king of the north defeats the king of the south, Raphi and Paneum. Would we take this history then as, as typifying a type of, uh, Raphia? Or do we, what do, what do we do with Alexander? So in this line here, you can see this is, this is, this is a line within our line that we're drawing out. And, and this line here doesn't doesn't really have the historical information. It's just taking symbols from this story and showing that those symbols apply in our history, right? So that's not the line we're drawing, but we we have to consider this. Now in this one, um, 
there's going to be this this time of the end in 1798. And, and the reason why we mark it there is because of uh, this February 15th date when the Pope is taken captive. And it's 191 years to um, February 15th, 1989, when the Soviet-Afghan War ends. So that's to the day. So, so we took that as significant there. Uh, so there's this sort of tie to this symbol of the King of the North and the King of the South fought, fighting against each other. And that might be key to understand this line. That is, in this line, in, in the historical line, we're going to have the globalists defeating Persia. In our line, the present truth line, we're going to have Persia defeating the globalists. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm asking? Ask it in a different way, please. Okay, so in in our history, we have 1798 and 1989. The South defeats the North in 1798. The North defeats the South in 1989, right? Rafi and Panim. In this history, we have... Something that more parallels 1798, right? Okay. <clears throat> it's, it's the South defeating the King of the North. The King of the North here is the United States military power along with the papacy. The King of the South is the Soviet Union. Okay. So, so we can, we, we can see then um that this is a reverse of what happened in this history that is it's this is is like comparing alexander the great to 1798 period preceding 1798 and then you have um in our history our parallel the present truth, truth application is 1989 does, does that does that make sense to do it that way? To have the one history showing the king of the south defeating the king of the north, and then the other history, the king of the north defeating the king of the south. I think it has a logical implication. Now yeah. the reason the, mm -hmm. the, the reason for my statement at this point, as, as you just pointed out, we have this one hundred and ninety one year yeah. period right yeah. again in 191 bc you have the battle of thermopylae where rome who is on ascendancy to become the king of the north defeats the king of the south at thermopylae yeah and we know that that's the exact center year of um the the 62 weeks. Correct. Right. Which are divided into, we divided into two periods of 217 years. And that symbol connects to, um, to, uh, uh, 217 BC, where we're going to have the Battle of Raphia. Right. So, yes. so there's a whole bunch of connections here. And, and so it seems that it is reasonable to say that a history of the King of the South defeating the King of the North can parallel the history of the King of the North defeating the King of the South. Right. Okay. Because we have that tie with 1798 and 1989. Because they're both times of the end, right? Correct. One's the King of the South defeating the King of the North, North and the other's the King of the North defeating the King of the South. So so I think it's it's perfectly reasonable to make that application. It's going to make this font bigger. Okay, so... Um, not sure how I could do this. I could put, um, I could put the historical application on the bottom or I could draw them as two separate lines. I think, I think I'm just going to draw them as two separate lines on the same page. I don't know if that makes the best sense, but there just might be a lot of information here. So this is going to be the history from uh, what we call the Soviet, how do you spell Afghan? A-F-G-H-A-N. 
There you go. You think I know how to spell, but anyway. You do. This is going to go 12, 24, 79, 2, 15, 89. So, and, and I guess what we could put, it, we would actually mark this war from, so, I mean, this is the time of Alexander the Great. Um, I'm not really sure uh, that's when he's going to be be there, but we would mark this this war. Uh, maybe I'll do it this way. So 334 to 331 BC, which I don't want to mold. Okay, so that's going to be the parallel. We we'll probably add some of those details in as we go along, but. <clears throat> But, you know, and that probably could be a line in and of itself. I mean, we do have sort of a line with the Soviet-Afghan war as well. Um, but for now, we're just trying to get this this basic line. So we're going to have the death of Alexander. Uh, that's going to mark the time of the end. So obviously in our history, that's going to be November 9th. And the death of Alexander we have as, I can't remember when they say he died. And they had... Um, Depending on the source, mm -hmm. they're saying that he died anywhere from the 10th to the 13th of June of 323. Yeah. Wikipedia has it the 10th or 11th. Britannica has it the 13th. Yeah. And I, I know I looked into it before and I, I had my opinion about it. <laughs> Um, and, and that's something I'm going to have to look up in more detail of how they, they, I remember there was some, some document, uh, that they had that was a dated document. Um, so, but anyway, we, we just have to put this for now as, uh, it's going to be, uh, 23, 323 BC. Now, if it, if Britannica is correct and he passed on the 13th of June. Yeah. On the Julian calendar, that would place it as the first day of the third month of 3723. The third day of the seventh month. Third, the third, excuse me, the first day of the third month. On, on the biblical calendar. Correct. Yeah, and it would just be a few days different on the Gregorian um, from the Julian. They're not that many days apart there. Right. Um, yeah, I think they'd be one or two days apart. Okay, so you got 323 BC. That's what we're going to have here for now. Now, so with the death of, of Alexander, just like with the fall of the Soviet Union, um we 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 have to have a message right so i mean we're looking here at history it's hard to say you know what the message is dealing with alexander the great um because it's not it's not a gospel message but it it is the sec secular history um paralleling a a reform line now the reform line obviously is going to be the establishment of something right so when you get to the third angel arrives that would be something has to have been accomplished and so i mean what is this line trying to to set up in the scriptures why is this line here why 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 does the bible even have this line about greece one of the things we know when rome arises rome exalts itself to establish the vision so and that vision is what vision? Calzon. Calzon vision, right? So, so obviously Greece, this line of Greece is trying to establish something in Bible prophecy regarding these powers, uh, in their interaction with God's people. Right? Wouldn't Greece be helping to establish the Mare? I'm okay. You're going to have to explain how. 
Well, we understand that the vision that is true, the Mare, needs to be established beginning about 457, right? Well, yeah. But the, the point of this is Greece is not going to be the dominant power throughout world history. No, it's not. I mean, it has its influence. All these kingdoms do. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome all have these different aspects that Rome or Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece have these aspects that Rome is going to take. Right. So it's going to have uh, a characteristic of Babylon, which is its pride, its its empire. It's going to have Medo, Persia, the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And it's going to have the art and philosophy of Greece. So in 457, you have the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which are dominant. Mm -hmm. By the time you come with Alexander after the death of his father, you have the Greek influence that then established is established throughout much of the known world unto the situation that occurs at Thermopylae because Alexander will continue. He He's going to establish himself much as the Medes and the Persians did over three geographic regions. Okay. But yeah, when he, these powers are going to do the similar types of things. We, we see this in Daniel chapter 8. Right. Right. So in Daniel chapter 8, it, it's going to start with Medo-Persia. Uh, that's because this vision. Um, now here, you, the vision that's going to be talked about here is this Chazon, right? In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision of Chazon appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So this is the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. It's going to be, um, I can't remember how how old Elamite says he is, 13 or something. So it's going to be, you know, about seven years maybe or so after the death of um, Nebuchadnezzar that that Daniel has this vision. And and my understanding of it is it's going to be... um, uh, trying to remember how that works how many years it is it's going to be something like 19 years or something before the fall of babylon i can't remember now 21 years trying to remember i I can't remember how many years i think it's 19 but and 21 years before the decree if i remember correctly but i could be wrong anyway i thought it it was nine a, a total of 19 years so yeah, I thought it was a total of from 19 to the fall of Babylon and then 21 years to Cyrus's decree or, you know, the year that Cyrus comes to the throne. But I'd have to look it up again. I can't remember. Um, so anyway, Belshazzar, um, it's in his third year, so not in his first year. Uh, but, you know, some people think, you know, they like I've seen people who try to put this like way later. You know, like shortly before Babylon falls, but it's actually quite a long time before Babylon falls. And and Daniel is brought to Shushan in the palace. That is, he's brought uh, to meet a Persia, and and it's in the province of Elam, which it's only in the province of Elam um, in in that, that history of Daniel. It's it's going to make later on move to a different province. Um. So anyway, it's just some information how we can know that Daniel wrote this. That it wasn't written later. Nobody would have known that later. But anyway, um, so he's brought into the future. So the question is exactly where? Well, he's probably brought to 457, right? But at that time, when he has the vision, I mean, he may have been to Persia. I don't know. It's possible in, in his duties. Uh, definitely at the time he wrote the book, because he wrote it uh, before he died. He didn't write it contemporaneously with the events. Um, so when he wrote it, he, he obviously had had he had been in Persia. 
But here he he goes back to this vision that he had had, you know, 21 years before or whatever, and and says, in this vision, I was in Shushan in the palace. And I was by the river of Uli, right? Whether he knew that when he originally had the vision or it's something that he figured out after he had been to Persia, I don't know, because he could have been to Persia before. And then he's going to see this ram with two horns. And uh, so Meda Persia, because of these two horns, um, it's going to be a, a parallel to the United States, right? So the rise of the United States. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we can take this history and we can we can look at Meda Persia representing the United States and Greece representing the globalists, right? And and in this case, we see that the globalists defeat the United States, right? If if we're going to look at a parallel here, which <clears throat> and and so this would be the Battle of Raphia that's being represented here, if we just want to put it into those terms. Now, we see the, the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward. So it's going to conquer uh, uh, three geographical locations, right? Correct. Okay. And then when we look at uh, the goat, right, Um you know, he's going to wax very great because the ram waxed great. When he was strong, the great horn was broken for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So this, of course, is Greece, the, the notable horn being Alexander. Um, and they're going to wax exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Right? And, of course, the pleasant land is Sibi, the glorious land. Right? Um, Palestine, Judea. All right. Okay. So it also has three geographical locations that it conquers. And and so now it says that this happens, well, after the the breaking of the notable horn. But when we look at, at Alexander, I mean, he conquers this kingdom earlier, right? Conquers these these kingdoms. So so how do we address that? Now, it could be that when it says, therefore, the he goat waxed great, when, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and four came up, four notable ones towards the, uh, towards the four winds of head. Now, one of them came forth a little horn. So this is going to be the papacy, right? Or Rome, I guess. So this is Rome actually going towards the southeast in the pleasant land. Is that correct? I think that's right. So it doesn't actually show Greece. It doesn't show Greece conquering the three geographical locations here. But Greece did. But Greece did. Okay. Because Medo Persia did, so Greece did. Okay. okay. I think I, yeah. I think the establishment of this point is going to be very important for our lines because Babylon had to do it. Media Persia did it. Greece did it. And then we look at the same pattern being followed by Rome. Yeah, the little horn. Okay. So, so we have, uh, but it just doesn't say here that Greece did it. But if, but it does conquer, it does conquer Medo Persia. Correct. So if, if the ram had done the three geographic areas and had been considered great and then the he goat waxed very great does it not make sense that they would have outdone in the same pattern exactly what the ram had done yeah so they conquer all of those geographical locations that were inhabited by persia right okay and then we have the little horn which is going to be rome in its two phases correct pagan and papal okay um, and then it's also going to wax great, uh, even to the host of the heaven and cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and stamp upon them. Now this, um, uh, where the new view of the daily is they're going to take this as, you know, they're going to cast down Christ's heavenly ministry to the earth, right? 
But um, when it talks about waxing great, even to the host of heaven, um, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground, what would that primarily be referring to? Because notice the masculine and feminine. So it is a feminine, right? Agreed. Okay. And then you're going to have a masculine. So the masculine is going to be pagan Rome because it's going to magnify himself to the prince of the host, to Christ. Right? Right. Okay. Um, and so, so that's where we would have to look at. Um, and when it talks about his sanctuary, that's going to be the sanctuary of pagan Rome. Right. So there's this masculine and feminine pagan and papal Rome. So this little horn has uh, the characteristics of pagan Rome and papal Rome, and it fluctuates between those. Now, papal Rome is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. Pagan Rome is a counterfeit of the earthly. Uh, the problem with the new view of the daily is it tries to say that the daily that is taken away is Christ's ministry. Agreed. Right. That, that's the main problem. So, um, and it gets rid of the whole basis for the 2300 days. Because if you say the daily was Christ's ministry, well, when was Christ's ministry taken away? How are you going to connect that to 538 or 508? And then the place of his sanctuary that's cast down, well, this is the sanctuary not of Christ, but the sanctuary, because it's this mikdash in this context, right? So this is um, going to be the sanctuary of, of Rome, right? And then a host was given, given him against the daily by reason of the transgression. It cast down to the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. And then they're going to have the question, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So this is going to deal with, in this case, uh, Kodesh is the word for sanctuary. And that that would refer to the heavenly sanctuary, right? Or not. Or God's sanctuary, I guess we would say. Now, it would be God's people. So there's, I have to go into a deeper study on this. But but the idea here is this is not a pagan sanctuary. I guess we can just say that, right? It's not a mikdash. So the sanctuary in verse 11 and the sanctuary in verse 13 are not the same sanctuary. Now we know the host is going to refer to God's people. So this is going to be uh, the daily transgression is paganism. The transgression of desolation is papalism, right? These two desolating powers. <laughs> okay. So, so this is going to be, you know, it's covering uh, Medo Persia, Greece and Rome. Okay. So how does this relate to what we're discussing here? as far as the role of Greece. Would you repeat that, please? Okay. So all this thing we discussed about the, you know, Babylon, Media, Persia, uh, or Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, we're discussing this in the context of the role of Greece in this line. So we know that Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. But what does Greece do? Another point, uh, going back to my studies I did in 2014 on Proto-Daniel, that is Leviticus 26, there is a parallel between the four seven times and the four lines of vision in Daniel's prophecy. Um, you're going to have the pride of your power. That's going to parallel what happens uh, with uh, the image that Nebuchadnezzar has in his dream and uh the image on the plains of Dura, right? I should break the pride of your power. And also what happens to Nebuchadnezzar personally uh, in his personal seven times, right? Uh, and then you're going to have uh, the second seven times, wild beasts will rob you of your children. Well, that's going to be the next prophecy, line of prophecy in Daniel. That's Daniel chapter seven, the wild beasts, right? So you can see the parallel there. 
And then you're going to have the third seven times. The third seven times is going to be uh, the siege, right? That's the one where it's going to talk about um, what's the what's the phrase? The phrase is I always forget the quarrel of my covenant. Uh, I'll bring a sword, sword upon you and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. So this is the third, and it says, when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. Do the ten women represent Greece? Ow. Okay, do we have the number ten to represent the world? Yes. Does Greece represent globalism? Okay, point. Right. And it, does Greece offer um because god is going to break the staff of your bread that is the word of god and um this is going to be then the philosophy of greece that now takes over this is this worldly secular philosophy and that would line up with which prophecy would that be daniel chapter 8 would that line up with uh what we see happening in that vision with Greece uh, conquering Medo-Persia as, and, and that's going to be uh, because you have Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece, Greece is also the third kingdom. So the third kingdom would line up with the third seven times and the fourth kingdom line up with the fourth seven times. All right. And, and so uh, the question is, uh, what is this role then of Greece? Now, it doesn't exalt itself to establish the vision like Rome does, but it's the quarrel of my covenant. This has to do with understanding God's word and the counterfeit message. And, and you can also put, line this up with the four generations as well, but I'm not going to go into that study right now. So four generations of Adventism. But if we're going to take... um this line of, of Greece, and we're going to try to understand what it's about. I mean, Greece, one is it's going to con conquer Medo-Persia. But then we're going to have this civil war that's going on. And, and there would have to be something in this line um, that's going to parallel, you know, the Battle of Raphia, the Battle of Paneum, right? It's going to mark the end of Greece, and and Rome is going to come into this history as well. So, so we would have to have something in you know if we look at the second angel arriving, well, this would have to be something that parallels nine eleven, right? All right. We would we would also have, I would think we would have Raphia and Paneum as the second angel formalized and the second angel empowered, I would think, but I'm, I'm not, I'm just suggesting that that's normally what I would look at is this is a line that's going to parallel our history. And, and here we have 1989, you know, are we going to have 9-11 here? Or are we going to have 11-9? We might not have 9-11 here. And then we're going to have Raphi and Paneum and then whatever this represents, the third angel arriving. The empowerment of the Sunday law. So I'm not I'm not sure how this line is going to to work out in in our history when we've 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 drawn this out in this in our understanding of the parallel. We're going to relate it specifically to what's happening uh, in the United States in this battle between wokeism and um you know whatever you want to call it the conservatism I don't know um, not sure if we we have specific word you know it has to do with Trump um, he's in that history so um, so when we look at this line right we go through what we have drawn um, it's going to go all the way up to you know the election it's going to do the election of Trump and then it's going to have Biden and um you know, all this stuff, it's going to go up to, uh, let me see, 2021. 
you know, it's going to have this whole history. We have to decide how we're going to sort this out as a separate line. Whether we have Greece as one complete separate line or not, but this is going to go all the way up to, you know, the close of probation. It's going to go up to April 5th, 2030 as a symbol, right? And, and then finally, ultimately, you know, the Sunday law, the loud cry, all those things are going to be in there. So we go all the way up to verse 16. That's, that's what we've done. We don't know though if this is just one line. I think we actually have two lines in here. We're going to have to decide this civil, these civil wars um, in Greece, how are they going to line up with um, our history? I guess that's the question. We, we don't know that yet because we had worked all of this out. And we don't know if it's going to work. That is, once we draw it on a line, we're going to notice a lot of things that we didn't notice before. And, and we might have lines within the lines. That is, there may be parts of these sections that actually are a zoom in to a particular way mark in, in this bigger line of, of the present truth application of Greece. Now, when we, and, and this is really confusing looking at this, but I mean, if we're going to take Greece, um, and we're going to deal with this battle of Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus, I mean, that's going to be in that that early history with the death of Alexander. That's going to be in the time of the increase of knowledge. And we would say, well, what do these these former generals um, fighting over uh, this have to do with this history? Now, we're saying that they represent the UN. They're not under one ruler. Right? So that's the way we looked at it. We come to November 9th. We have December 25th, um, and then we have these four Hellenistic um, empires, so to speak. This is globalism, and it's going to be divided, right? So now what happened with the Soviet Union is going to be paralleled with what happens with these powers fighting over this territory. And there's, now there's two different powers, the Seleucid, and the Ptolemic, right, that eventually developed the king of the north and the king of the south. And now the United Nations, even though it's a globalist um, organization, how is it connected to the U.S.? I mean, the U.S. is part of the United Nations, but more specifically. And is the U.S. involved in a war with the U.N.? I would have to think yes. Okay. Now, we know that the U.N., uh, is in the U.S., right? In New York. Correct? Yeah. No and, and the United States has a, a huge controlling power in the United Nations. We would agree with that. They have great influence, yes. And, and the United States has always been seeking to control the U.N. And to a large degree have, even though you have all of these other nations. And I think the UN is a very strange organization in that respect. I mean, all these nations want to be part of the UN. But every, I don't know if every nation is. I think there's some that aren't. But, um, but there's a battle going on, and the globalists want to have control of the UN, but the UN wants to have control of the United States. And the, U, the U.S. has always resisted that. Now, we, we have a position that... There are ways in which the UN has taken over the United States. One would be the Patriot Act, right? And um, and then we also have uh, what happened when Trump loses this election to Biden. That this is a victory for the UN. Now, now is the UN really about wokeism? I mean, we talk about wokeism. What is wokeism as far as the UN is concerned? And that's kind of a broad question. Isn't it almost their religion? Okay, well, what if I said it's a tool? I mean, do we think the elitists really believe in wokeism? Or is wokeism just a tool a tool to destabilize the United States and the world? 
Okay, and, and instead of tool, is it a weapon to destabilize the world? Okay, a weapon. Yeah. Well, to me, yeah, same same kind of idea. It's it's a weapon, right? Um, I mean, do you think people really in the UN really want their children to become uh, transgendered? That they would, you know, that the elite would love it if their children were transgendered. Uh, they wouldn't, would they? Well. In most cases, they would not. There are some that are playing it that they think it's a wonderful thing. Oh, yeah. Right. But, I mean, it depends who you call the elite. I mean, I, I don't usually put actors and and entertainers in that class, though they might think they are. No, I'm not. I mean, I'm talking about the people who are extremely wealthy, who want to control the world. And they use the media, they use celebrity and so forth. Uh to destabilize the world because their goal is to be in control of the world and, and they need to destabilize the United States specifically uh, in order to take over the United States for whatever real reasons they have behind it on a personal level. It's hard to know, uh, but it is part of Satan's plan uh, to destroy the world. And so they definitely are participating in that whether wittingly or unwittingly in different individuals' cases, right? So a lot of these people believe that they're doing good, right, in, in what they're doing. Uh, but the good that they are doing is the idea that they need to run things. They need to save us from ourselves. That would be uh, the main agenda of the elites. Okay, so so anyway, when when we start to look at this, you know, who is being conquered, right? Um, I mean, you're going to have the North and the South, and they're seeking to conquer the world. So you have two different ideologies at war. They both have the same goal. They want to control the world. The United States wants to control the world. And the globalists want it, the UN. They want to control the world. How do we get it that, you know, Trump would be the king of the North and, and the globalists are the king of the South? You know, because we're dealing with Greek, Greece. Greece is the king of the south in in the symbol. Of, uh, it's the globalist, I guess I should say. But there's a civil war. So both of these, the United States and the UN, can we say they're both globalist powers? I would think yes. Okay. So they're both globalist powers. So, you know, so when we talk about the globalists, um, you are not generally talking about the United States, but the United States is a globalist power. It has a view of the world that it has been wanting to impose. And that view is different than the UN's view, at least in the past. Right? They're not the same view. Correct. So the American view, whether people agree with that or not, it is based upon... Uh, the American Constitution, which which is which is a religious document, can we say that? And and the UN, it's it's based on what what kind of document? I mean, some people would argue for a humanist uh, view of the United States Constitution, but I, I think that's extremely um, misguided. Right? The idea of inalienable rights that are given by God. Is that humanist? No. So what, what is humanism? We, have, we haven't really talked about that term. But we would say the UN is humanist. They take the position that, that uh, the human race has been getting better and better when, in fact, it has been, of course, falling. Okay. Well, here's what uh, one definition of humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. Now, is the United States Constitution humanist? I wouldn't say so. No, it, it definitely is not humanist. Now, it, it it stresses the rights of the individual where humanism doesn't. Now, uh, there's a book by Thomas Sowell called um, 
uh, conflicting visions. And he deals with uh, these two different visions of the world. One is called, um, uh, oh, what's the, I can't think of the words. Um, but basically, basically, one vision of the world is that man is intrinsically sinful and that life is hard and that, um, you know, man is not good and um, that men need to men need to have freedom to make their own choices. Um, I just can't think of the word that he uses. The something vision, the other um, the un one is un and the other one is they both start with C, uh, and then one is I can't think of what the name is, what the word is. Um, but in in humanism, it believes that man is good, naturally good. So that that would be basically the two different visions. And if man is naturally good, it's going to change uh, the way that you look at the world compared if you mean that, believe that man is naturally bad, right? So those are those are these two different visions. I uh, just going to have to find a book. <laughs> Maybe I can just look it up. Uh, conflict of visions. Yeah, so so the summary, yeah, so one believes um, in destroying the institutions and the other one believes in preserving institutes. So they're called the constrained vision and the unconstrained. So in a constrained vision, because you pe believe that people are naturally bad, um, you need the, the process of the rule of law and the experience of tradition, right? In the unconstrained vision, it relies heavily on the belief that human nature is essentially good. Those with an unconstrained vision distrust decentralized processes. That is, every problem that we have is because of the state. That's the unconstrained vision, right? And um, they believe there's an ideal solution to every problem and that compromise is never acceptable. Collateral damage is merely the price of moving forward on the road of perfection, that collateral damage is people, right? Uh, so Thomas Sowell often refers to them as the self-anointed. So those are the elites. Um, um, ultimately, they believe that man is morally perfectible. Because of this, they believe that there exist some people who are further along the path of moral development, have overcome self-interest, and are immune to the influence of power and therefore can act as surrogate decision makers for the rest of society. So that's, you know, I think that's pretty clear, right? So so these competing visions of the world uh, would describe this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. Does that make sense? Now, now we would be, hopefully, all of us here, uh, we would believe that man is is naturally bad. And so we would have the constrained vision. But in this battle between these two different powers, both are corrupted, right? That is, we, we don't see the globalists as our enemy in this, this battle, right? It's going to be those that are professing to believe in the constrained vision that are going to be the ones that we fear the most. Correct? All right. I mean, you know, because if we were going to take sides, which we're not, but if we were going to take sides, well, we would we would side with the constrained vision, you know, the rule of law and order and all those things. But what's going to happen is that in the backlash with wokeism, whatever you want to call it, these ideas, we could call it humanism. There's going to be a lot of collateral damage. And the solution to stop the craziness is going to be worse than the craziness itself. That is, there's going to be a destabilization of society and um, people are going to side with what they think is the good side, you know, the one that's common sense. But in doing so, uh, we're going to bring in the Sunday law, right? That's, that's the position that we would have, I would think, in this movement. Any thoughts on that?
So what, whatever this is, whatever this line is, it's going to be this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. And it's ultimately going to end with the Sunday law. That would be agreed. Okay. So how that's going to look when we draw it out on a line, I don't know. I don't know how that's. But, but we're going to have to look at the events uh, that happen that are in those verses. And we're going to have to be able to set them up on a line. And we're going to have to have the parallel events on the line below that. And, and I think this is going to be a very helpful exercise. It's going to take us some time, right, to do because we need to understand thoroughly uh, this history and how it applies to our lines presently. And, and it may be a much more complicated line. Uh, that is, there may be many lines within these lines. That is, some of these scriptures may be describing something that we, we put as a waymark, but is actually a line in and of itself in our history. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Uh, just an observation. Okay. Uh, with the United Nations, I suppose it could be traced back to the United Nations and so forth, but uh, there was um, a lot of it sort of based on the Atlantic Charter which occurred okay. on the 14th of August, 1841. Sorry, 1941. So that was okay. Churchill and Roosevelt when they met in Newfoundland. And when that was signed, it was uh, an inclusive count. It was 1,533 days until the actual United Nations uh, was set up. Okay, do you have that line anywhere? Well, you can just check it on Wikipedia. I know it's the Atlantic Charter. Okay. 1941. Yeah, so that's uh, the, what date? It was on the 14th of August. Okay. Signed. You sort of say this is like one of the basis for the, the current. Okay. Of what uh, was to be the United Nations. Okay. And, and from that there date, United, uh, the United States hadn't entered the war until Pearl Harbor after that, so it was three months and 23 days until the United States entered the war. So I don't know, it just came to my mind, 323, you know, death yeah. of Alexander. Okay, so I'm going to have to keep that in mind as we go through these studies. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I mean, I do have the United Nations in my line somewhere. I don't remember exactly where. Okay, thanks for that. So let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning and for the opportunity once again to, to study together. And we're thankful for each person. We pray that you can bless them today and help us in all that we do, um, all the tasks that we have to complete. And bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name.